And as we come today, we want to, we've been studying uh, the doctrine of the church, uh, ecclesiology, and uh, we, uh, in previous weeks, we've been studying, uh, and if you have your books, your lesson books, we were looking at uh, the officers of the church, and particularly the biblical qualifications. Uh, last week, we sort of wrapped that up. Um, and uh, I, I thank, for, thank you for braving the weather, um, you know, because it's been kind of tough with the snow and so forth. But I uh, thank you for, for braving the weather. Um, but we, we sort of wrapped that up. And one of the things that we were, we, we devoted uh, much attention to was the uh, part about the husband and one wife uh, what that meant, um, and because there was, um, it, 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 because theologians don't always agree on what it means, uh, we tried to try to determine what Paul's, um, what it, what what was his purpose, what was his intent um, when the Holy Spirit put that there, because uh, he could have very easily made it plain plainer, uh, but I think he he did. I, I think there's a, and what we tried to do was to see what else in the text um, gave us an idea of what he what he what he meant, and and I think we can sort of accomplish that. Uh, at least we uh, we seemed to agree last week when we talked about it. Um, it talked about uh, one who rules well his own house, and one who was not a novice, and um, one who has a report, a good report, both inside the church and outside the church. Uh, one who was blameless. That is, that you couldn't throw in accusations and, and they would stick. So we're going to, we, we, we're prepared to move on from there, unless you have questions. And I encourage you that if you do have questions, or something you don't understand, feel free to ask. If you have a contribution, feel free to let me know and we'll recognize you. Um, but uh, this is not my lesson. This is your lesson, in, in effect, or our lesson. Uh, I learn as well, and I try to moderate. Uh, but if you have questions, feel free to ask, because I, I'm sure that somebody else is thinking along the same lines. Um, we want to start with prayer. And... Um, so I'm going to ask you to bow with me. Father God, we are so grateful um, for you looking down upon us and, uh, and, and having mercy on us. We thank you for opening our ears and our eyes to, uh, to know you. Um, and we uh, thank you, dear Lord, that we can assemble today together, uh, uh, like-minded believers, of, uh, of the precious faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we are, are, are grateful because we realize that in many countries that people are not able to assemble. Uh, in many countries, they are even being persecuted for their faith, uh, persecuted for having the Bible, persecuted for telling somebody else about Christ. Uh, so we pray with thanksgiving that we can meet together, but we also pray for those in other countries who are undergoing persecution. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, give them comfort and peace and allow them to know that you know about them and you care about them and, um, and that your purposes are being carried out. Uh, we thank you for uh, the time we have in your, in your word. We pray that you would uh, guide us by your spirit. And Father, we pray that uh, you would um, help us to know and understand the things that you would have us to know and to do as we implement and, and uh, pass along the things that we've learned uh, concerning the church, concerning the qualifications of a pastor and the offices, and all that you would have us to know uh, concerning the church. We give you thanks and ask you to help us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start, uh, if you would turn with me, to the biblical duties of the pastor. The Biblical Duties of the Pastor, on page 213, if you have your lesson book. 
And um, you see them listed there. It says one is, is that he's to be an example. He's to rule. He's to guard right doctrine. He's to perfect or help mature the saints, edify or build up the body of Christ, and to preach the word. Now, none of these are strange to us. We, we've seen them constantly. Many of them are part of the seven core values. So, um, but what we want to do is uh, just, just go through them um, briefly uh, to get an idea of, of the duties of the pastor. And then I'm going to ask you to think about, because I don't know if we're going to have time today, but to, it's not in here, but think about the duties of a believer or the duties of a believer to the pastor. Uh, I want you to think about that as well. Uh, turn with me, if you, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. And uh, if someone would, would you please, we'll begin at verse 1. Uh, someone, please read for us 1 Peter chapter 2, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Thank you. 
Yet, oh my, <laughs> that's a lot better. I'm glad, I'm glad you, you're awake. <laughs> oh my, I thought I had it on. Um, but I'm glad, you know, somebody's watching. Uh, the next, the next example here is uh, the the duty of a pastor. He says is to rule. And if you would, let's take a look at First Timothy chapter five, verse seventeen. And if you have First Timothy five seventeen, would you share it with us? Would you please read it aloud? Okay, thank you. Uh, let those who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Uh, the author doesn't give us, he doesn't exactly explain what he means when he gives the, the examples. But what does he, what do you think it means to rule? To be in charge. It does mean to be in charge. Um, matter of fact, uh, proestomy, I believe that's how I heard the sounding of that word, uh, to be over, to superintend, to preside over, to lead, to manage, to be at the head of, all of those are words that uh, describe the duties of the pastor. And uh, Paul did not mean to rule in the sense of a dictator or tyrant. Matter of fact, uh, I would, uh, Larry, you read that verse the last time in 1 Peter. I believe it's 1 Peter. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. And I recall that you were doing a series on that, were you not? Yes. Yeah, and, and so, if because I think both of these, they sort of tie in a little bit. Um, if you go back to First Peter, and verse 2, he says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight, not by constraint, but, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Um, and so we see here a similar thing that that uh, that was Peter. And here we see Paul writing something something similar in uh, 517. Um, I, the thing that I that struck me here, he says, not by constraint. What does he mean by constraint? By force. So you're making somebody do something. Is that right? Pressuring somebody to do something. Uh, and so that's not the way the church of God is to be run. Okay, so he's to lead the pastor. So he, uh huh. Yes. Um, in verse one, he says, the elders who are among you, which is a good case for plurality of elders. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. It's plural, you say. Thank you, Larry. And um, so we see um, here it does not mean to dictate, uh, to be a dictator or a tyrant, but in the sense of one who administers and leads. Okay. And then um, to follow up on um, what uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, let the elders... Uh, that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. So 
The idea implies, to rule well implies, conscientious devotion to the ministry. That is, preaching and teaching and the study that undergirds it. Uh, ruling well in word, um, the preaching and doctrine, the study of the word. Also, um, the call for double honor uh, may have had a military reference. That was something I found, although this is not necessarily part of this. But um, it says some to soldiers were paid double for being of such great value to the army. And that's where they get, that's where they believe that they got the term double honor. The leaders of congregations are like military officers, and those in the congregation are like the soldiers. Got the connection, right? As in an army, the soldiers do the work under the guidance of leaders. Leaders are not the ones who do the work while the soldiers sit on the sidelines. Uh, as leaders of an army of doers, they deserve double honor, meaning both honor and financial support. So uh, that's what Paul is referring to. But what we want to get out of is that they were to administer, to rule, to lead. Uh, that's what the uh, that's one of the duties that he's referring to here for the pastor. Um, number C. He says to guard right doctrine. Let's turn to Titus chapter one, verse nine. Let's talk about this one a while. Uh, he said to guard right doctrine. And in Titus 1 9, someone read that, please. Okay. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. Right. He's studying uh, because he has to teach. And so he's studying. And so he's saying that it's important for him to hold fast. Is that what I'm hearing you say, Kathy? Anybody have anything to add to that? Mm -hmm. uh, first Timothy. Good. Uh, first Timothy one three. Mm -hmm. As I urged you when I came into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that teach no other doctrine. Right. Don't differentiate from what the apostles taught. Hold fast to that which was given to you. Keep, guard it. Don't, don't defile it. Don't pollute it. Keep it the same way. Get this. A purpose to guard it, to keep it the same way. Mm -hmm. When you hold fast to something, you, you don't, you don't um, abandon it. I've heard some people give testimonies about pastors saying that they are still they're, they're still preaching the word of God the way it was delivered to the apostles. They haven't swerved from mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. They haven't compromised. Mm -hmm. They haven't abandoned mm -hmm, 
Okay. That should be their testimony. Okay, it should be. Um, because we see society changes, their views change, and they want you to change with the times. Otherwise, you're a dinosaur. And dinosaurs are extinct. You know, but <clears throat> so sure. Go ahead. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies. I studied this, so that's Gnosticism. I'm not going to mm -hmm. go into it. Which cause dispute rather than godly, because this is what this is what sound doctrine will give godly edification, which is in faith. It gives. Godly edification. All the rest of the stuff is not gonna. It's not gonna do anything for you. Mm -hmm. It's gonna cause a lot of problems, arguments, dissension, factions. But if you stick with the word, mm -hmm. the saints will be edified. Right. And then because there's only one meaning. There's only one meaning. Mm -hmm. Many applications, mm -hmm. but one meaning. Right. And so that's what we. That's what we as saints who know the word. That's what we want. And a faithful pastor. We'll teach that. Exactly. We will, we will hold to the doctrine. And, that, that, and that's what, uh, hold fast Amen. to the doctrine, as you point, as both of you pointed out. Um, why is that important? Why is it important to hold fast to the doctrine that we have? I mean, what if we just start teaching something else? What? Like, okay. like I said, it gives edification. It builds us up. Mm -hmm. It nourishes up. You, see, you said to feed the flock. Right. It's just like it's just like having a, a newborn baby and just, just just start giving them junk food. Mm -hmm. You'll shrivel up and die. Mm -hmm. Kill them. And that's exactly right. what would happen. Because we would be that's a good term. We would be giving junk food mm. to the generation coming behind us who have to hear this word. And junk food will cause them to go astray and die. Malnourished. Yeah. Brother Larry? It's a lie to deceive us and to explain us. It's true. Mm -hmm. So we want to study God of the truth. Other stuff will get, as Bill said, will get us scared off and we start fighting each other. Right. Right. That's true. Uh, if you get off the word, the word is what draws us. Amen. Stay with the word. The word is what draws us here particularly the manner, we get off from that. I do believe you have all kind of issues going on. People leaving, people not exactly, fights and so forth. Yes, Carl? We're not to change it. That's right. Um, and, and go ahead. Say, and he's so serious. He's so serious about that. If you go to the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. there's a warning and Absolutely. a judgment for those who do. Exactly. I don't know it, but we, we might. Oh, it's, 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 I think it's the last, last chapter. And it's not just Revelations either. I think it's also written in Daniel. But he says in Revelation 22. Beginning at verse 18. If you have it. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these Things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city 
and from the things which are written in this book. So you're right. Absolutely. It is a serious offense. Um, matter of fact, Paul uh, made it very clear that he wanted the word cut straight. Uh, he used that term, cut uh, um, rightly divided. Um, so, yes, it's very important that uh, we follow and not only follow, but guard. And, and that's what the, uh, the term here um, to guard right doctrine. And Paul reminded Titus that uh, Christian leaders, um, he reminded them of their responsibility as pastors to guard the body of revealed truth from perversion. That is from turning aside from truth uh, unto corruption or distortion or, or error. And the, uh, the pastor needs to be grounded in the word so that he can encourage people to trust Christ through the word. <clears throat> and also to be able to refute those who stand opposed to God and, um, and curse him and refuse to surrender to him. Um, <clears throat> so we have to, uh, and, and he points out that there's a way of doing that. Uh, to refute means to rebuke a man in such a way that he is compelled to see and to admit the error of his ways. Uh, the aim of the Christian rebuke is not to humiliate a man, but to enable him to see and to recognize and to admit the truth of the word to which he is either blind or disobedient uh, to. Oh, I said to admit it. I'm not sure if I wrote that right. It was late. <laughs> um, but but the whole point is, is that. Uh, we do we do all in love to uh, our purpose is that if we can have people to repent of their sins, that's that's the idea. Um, we're not out to put somebody down or anything like that, but we are there to stand for truth and to, uh, uh, of the gospel. And Paul, I don't think it's in this part of the lesson, but. Turn with me to Second Timothy, chapter four, I believe it is, or maybe it's chapter three. I'll know in a moment. Yes, Second uh, Timothy, chapter four. That when Paul was giving Timothy this charge, because Paul was on his way out. And he told he charged he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And you know, when you think about that, that's a charge for us too. Amen. Charge for us too. He says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. And what does that mean? Mm hmm. Whatever the occasion, you got to be faithful to the word. And, you know, he says something and I always love this particular part that he says. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find it here. Um, I'll find it. I'll find it at some point. Um, in, in chapter two. Second Timothy, chapter two. Verse 11. He says, it is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him. He also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful. He cannot deny himself. Okay, so he's telling us to be faithful. He's telling us to be faithful to the word. In season, out of season. So, yes, we do have to guard the word. That's that's what it's 
That's what it's saying. Um, the, the next one, he talks about uh, to perfect or help mature the saints. Ephesians 4.12. Let's turn to that one. Ephesians 4.12. And if you have it, please read it. Thank you. I know you recognize that one, right? It's one of the core values, right? Okay. Um, what is now the author list here for us in number D, he says, uh, 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 the, one of the biblical duties of the pastor is to perfect or help mature the saints. So when we read uh, Ephesians 4.12, what is it telling us there for, per, per, for perfecting of the saints? What does that mean? Well, he, he, it does mean that in, in edifying, and that's the next core value that he gives. But let's go back, look at, actually, we have to go back to the verse before it, okay, to understand what perfecting of the saints is. Uh, take a look at verse 11. Someone read verse 11. Okay, thank you. And so he gave these gifts for what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. OK, he, he, he gave he gave pastors. That's what a pastor's job is to help us be more mature in the word. Right. To teach us, to help us to understand. And so God gave the gift. to, uh, And that's what he says in the previous verse that God gave some. Apostles and some prophets. Do we still have apostles and prophets? Not anymore. They serve their purpose, right? And we have the word now. Huh? Isn't that, isn't that something? <laughs> some still call themselves apostles, too. The whole all gamut. Of, all mm -hmm. of them are in this one body. Mm -hmm. And a woman preacher. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I have a question. When people are in, and I want to say biblical ignorance like that, do you acknowledge them? Do you call them? If they come, should, should come here one Sunday and mm -hmm. stand and say, I'm Apostle Johnny Cash. Um, when you see them, are you supposed to say, Apostle Cash, how you doing? Should you honor them as that? I've, I've never had the had that, uh, you know, have to do that. But no, I wouldn't honor. Uh, I would honor what the Bible says. And, um, you know, I'll call them uh, minister so and so. You know, or a brother and sister. Right. Right. Uh, you know, but uh, not an apostle, not. Uh, that happened uh, uh, the other day at the at the services, and um, I think somebody got up and announced themselves as a yeah. But the the Muslim he was one, but I thought somebody announced themselves as an apostle or or maybe it was the Muslim. I'm not sure, but I thought it was somebody who announced themselves as an apostle or prophet or something. Okay, okay. Uh, did Pastor acknowledge him? He he said something else. He called he called he called him by uh, a minister or or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was the um, the chaplain. It was the chaplain, and I believe he may have called her chaplain. I think that's I think that's what he may have called her. I don't remember now. I'm trying to remember, but I believe that's what he called her, chaplain. Uh huh. Right. 
Right. So you have those situations. Um, but I would call them what the scriptures call them. You know. Did you yeah. say sister, brother? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because um, I do business with a pastor. She calls herself a pastor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I call her home, I ask for Ms. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Mm-hmm. She's married. Ms. Mm-hmm. Phillips. Mm-hmm. I do not say, may I please speak to Pastor. Pastor. Mm-hmm. I don't do that. Mm-hmm. But she'll say, Pastor speaking. And I'll say, hi, Ms. Phillips. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, I just wanted to bring that out because. When we call them by that misnomer, we are affirming or compromising right. the right. scriptures. Right. And and I know a lot of times you're in business settings and they come in and pass this on so and you know and some people just flow with it. They do. Some saints Absolutely. flow with it. Sure. Instead of putting a peg on exactly. the thing and saying Mr. So and so exactly. Mr. So and so. But sometimes we just Go with the flow. Absolutely. It's easier to go with the flow. Go with the flow. Uh, everybody else is doing it. Why are you going to stand it. out? I'm going to do it. You know, that's what people say. But no, I, I stay with what the scriptures are. I don't, don't want to affirm, uh, uh, like you say, uh, the error or add my two cents to the error. No. Um, we have to, I, I believe, just as you do. No, I'm not going to add to uh, an error that I that I see. Um, <clears throat> so, but but what what we see here is that we we see that God has given us gifted men, and if they want to uh, contest that, particularly a woman, I just take it back to the scriptures. Now, if she wants to hear that, obviously they haven't, but if you lay it out, it's there. A matter of fact, Paul said he, um, he I believe it was to Timothy, he told him that he, uh, I forgot the word he used, but he, suffer not a, a woman to teach. That That's right. To, to, to take by force. Exactly. Something to, that is not rightfully yours. Exactly. First Timothy Sure. And to, to have rule over the man. And, you know, people may say, well, the times have changed. Well, Paul's argument was not about the time. His argument was that the issue uh, of the principle that Adam fell, was he, he was deceived. that's right. He came Timothy, from the woman. First Timothy 1:12. Yeah. I think it's so, 1 or 2. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> yes, first Timothy 2:12. Right, right. That's it. That's it. But um and then he, he said that, but to be, and then he goes on to say, to make it even clearer. He says, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to assert the authority of the man, but to be in silence. Yeah, and, and then he gives the, the argument, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. So it, it's, it, it's uh, what I see is that it's, it's rather, rather clear. And um, I'm not going to add to the error by acknowledging something that they want, you know, that that I find to be an error. Um, Let's see. Now, going back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, he talks about, excuse me, just a moment. He um, he talks about uh, edifying Loretta, and this is, I believe, where you were referring to. That uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and this is for to help build up the body by teaching and and by encouraging and um, um, by um, comforting. And strengthening, and that you become uh, built up. Um, and then, lastly, he talks about to preach the word. To preach the word. Matter of fact, we we looked at that one, but we're going to look at it again. Um. 
where he talks about to perfect, he says to make someone completely adequate or sufficient for something, to make uh, adequate or to furnish completely, to cause to be fully qualified and adequacy. Uh, so that's that's our object. That's the objective, is to to um, make us fully qualified. You know, how do you know when you're fully qualified? I don't know when you know when you're fully qualified. I'm always studying, always learning. But I, I, I share this with you. We come to Bible study. We come to prayer services. We come to uh, uh, hear the word. And we're always learning. But, you know, what you know may be more than what somebody else knows. And you can share that with them to help them come to Christ. Okay, so uh, we're, we're always learning. Uh, once service starts, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to listen to pastor. Amen. And I'm going to learn. You know what? When pastor finishes, he's going to go back to school where he's Amen. studying. Amen. Okay. And when the time comes again, I'm going to go back to school where I can study. And you're going to continue to come and study. And so my point is, is that we're always learning. And we can always share what we know. And so um, um, that, that I just want to say that because when we talk about uh, preaching the word, and this is what, uh, let me see, going back, Paul spoke of the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Among the many gifts that Christ gave to his people, Christ gave gifted leaders. And Paul listed four groups uh, of church leaders. Uh, they were specifically called to proclaim the news of Christ in the church. Um, and we talked about building up uh, the preaching. Um, the word, what does it mean to preach? Preach the word. He says, preach the word. What is he saying? To, pro to proclaim the word. OK. And, and we, we do that publicly. OK. We, we proclaim what. God has given us. What do you say? <laughs> What's in the book? Sir? <laughs> what is written? <laughs> um, <laughs> it is written. Yeah. And it is written. Amen. So that's what we're proclaiming. What is written? OK. Not what Benson. You don't come here to hear what I got to say. You can't even hear what the word says. And that's what I want to hear, too. Amen. I want to hear what the word says. So. Um, and, and that was the charge. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, to preach the word is used of the um, public proclamation of the gospel and matters pertaining to it. Um, and, of course, uh, preaching was done by John the Baptist and by Christ and the apostles and other Christian leaders. In 2 Timothy 4.1, Paul describes the Lord to whom Timothy was preaching. Matter of fact, uh, we just looked at that. Uh, if you turn back to that, that is awesome. Just think about this. First Timothy chapter four, verse two. Second Timothy, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm um, see you're you're listening. <laughs> Appreciate that. Second uh, Timothy chapter four, verse two. Um, it, it, he says that I charge thee before God who and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Uh, that, that's just awesome when I think about that. Uh, but he knows all and he knows when we teach truth and when we don't, when we veer off. So he's saying uh, Paul described the, uh, the Lord for whom he was preaching. He is the one who will judge the living and the dead when he appears at the second coming. Hmm? And uh, Timothy was serving Jesus, the judge of all the earth, by his teaching. And so are we. And in keeping with what he had just said about scriptures uh, being sufficient to equip believers, Paul now charged Timothy to preach the Bible. Timothy needs to know the scriptures, not only for sermons and classes, but also for any moment when he might be called on to address an issue. Uh, you know, Peter said that, too. You remember what Peter said? What did he say? 
that's it. That's it. You heard what she said. Be ready to give an answer to, to any man that asked you of the hope that is within you. Okay? And so we need to have that answer, you know, particularly this time of season. Christ came to die for our sins. He, he was born um, and, and God became a man. And uh, that's a, a knockout story for those who receive it. Um, and he was to be ready to correct and to challenge others with kindness in the manner uh, of speaking truth. So. That's where we want to end. Um, Next week, we want to uh, complete that section. We're going to look at the the section on the deacons and their duties. We couldn't get that today, but uh, we'll talk about the deacons' qualifications. You'll see that on page 213. Um, The biblical term, the qualifications for deacons and their duties. And we'll probably try to also do the portions on the ordinances of the church. So I just ask you to uh, continue to take a look at the word. Uh, Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's why you got gifts today. Uh, Apologize. Um, It's not a lot, but it's just something uh, to help you uh, to remember what the church is about. Uh, There's a there's a little something. Okay. So thank you.